The next case on the calendar is Moore Charitable Foundation versus PJT Partners. Council. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Stephen Shackelford for the foundation and Kendall J. Mack. I'd ask to reserve two minutes for rebuttal, please. Yes, you have it. Thank you. The key issue today before the court is whether to endorse what I would call the first fraud free rule. That's effectively respondent's position and the first department's position. Under that rule, even if, as we alleged here, an employer knows that its employee has dangerous propensities and the employer still sends that employee out into the world to try to recruit new customers or new participants in their deals, the employer has no liability for harm caused by that, employee, that, by that employee if the harm is done to potential customers who happened not to have transacted with the, with the company in the past. Council, I, I know what you say what the employer do, the, the drinking, the trading, and the, the fee, the lie about the fee. I'm, I'm a little hazy on when the employer knew about those things, especially the drinking and the trading. Can you, can you just illuminate that a little bit? Of course, Your Honor. We allege that the, uh, that the drinking and the obsessive trading went on at all relevant times. And when did the employer have and, and knowledge of it? Or, we, or is this a constructive knowledge? He should have known about it. Well, we allege that he both either, that the employer either knew or should have known, and we don't limit it as to time. I mean, we allege that the employee factually was coming into work after lunch, having drank 10 to 15 alcoholic beverages. And that alone, a jury could infer that the company knew about it, because how can you really, how, how can you show up for work that inebriated, go into meetings, inebriated, as we allege. And I, re I realize we don't have a record here because this, this happened at the pleading stage, but do you know how long that had been going on prior to uh, uh, the, the fraud? Uh, many months is, is my understanding, and we allege at all relevant times. Many months, okay. I mean, the, the, it, obviously the record is what is alleged in the pleadings, which is all relevant times, and we have reason to believe from having spoken to the employee that it had gone on for quite some time. Do you think that level of drinking, even if it had gone on continuously, in and of itself would be enough to, for the pleading standard? If, you, if we were to ignore the other allegations, Your yeah. Honor, I do think for a, an employee in this particular position, entrusted with very high-level financial responsibilities, entrusted by the employer to deal specifically with clients and counterparties in these transactions, permitted by the employer to send out invoices and, and, and take fees in, we think that level of drinking by itself would be enough uh, to, to carry a negligent supervision and negligent retention claim on these particular facts for this kind of an employee in this business. It's well, where the conduct is in some, you know, intentionally tortious act, I could maybe understand notice uh, regarding that he might not be performing his job up to acceptable standards, but I'm not sure I understand the nexus between either the drinking or the obsessive trading and the propensity to commit a tortious act. How, how, how do we get there? So, Your Honor, it's, it is a combination here. And I, I don't want the court to forget about the lie, the bald-faced lie. No, I'm not forgetting. The, <laughs> I think that we, we believe that is enough by itself. And we allege that they knew it was a lie and chose not to, not to proceed with any further action with the employee. But the drinking and effectively the obsessive online trading, a gambling problem in some ways, it might not be a problem for uh, you know, a warehouse worker. But for someone in this position, I mean, through common sense, a juror or we can see this is exactly why, for instance, in positions of, uh, that, that require discretion in the government, like for access to secret or top secret clearance, drinking and gambling problems are absolutely red flags that you can't put they in that position. They are red flags. I mean, the, 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 that's, that's exactly what I've been calling it for weeks. <laughs> Those are red flags. But then the next question I ask myself are red flags of what? And, you know, since the notice requirement generally tends to notice a propensity to commit some act, I, I then ask myself, well, does, does excessive drinking put you on notice that they could commit this tortious act? I, I'm just not sure about that. I, so, again, ignoring the lies about the fee, obsessive drinking, excessive drinking and obsessive trading, the natural outgrowth of that is someone loses a lot of money. They're irresponsible. They're in a lot of personal trouble. But and if, yet, unless you're clear that they are losing money, that they're in debt, the creditors are calling, 
Is the fact that you're spending your money that way sufficient alone without complaints from others? It, it's a it's a fair question as to whether they had to have whether they would have had knowledge that he was losing his money. But coming into your job as a high powered person in charge of the secondaries business, very drunk every afternoon and spending most of your time trading speculative options on a personal account when you're supposed to be a responsible financial uh, employee of the, of the firm. In the motion process here, what's the standard with respect to that, that would apply? Does, does that even matter, applying the standard with respect to the court's consideration on the, the motion? So that, that's, a, that's a great question, Your Honor. The pleading standard, because this is at the motion to dismiss stage, is accepting facts alleged as true and giving the pleading a liberal construction and affording the plaintiff the benefit of every possible favorable inference. So at this stage, we don't know whether they were talking internally about how irresponsible he was, what, you know, this might, guy might be trouble, we should keep, we should really figure out what's going on with him. He, maybe he shouldn't be in front of a client at this point. Maybe we should make sure we control, I mean, th that evidence may exist. We don't know if it exists yet. At this stage, given what we were able to allege, having spoken to Mr. Kasperson and others, yeah, we believe is sufficient that a jury could infer at the end of the day, if this is all the evidence we ever have, that they must have known this person was a real danger to commit this kind of tort, to commit fraud. Uh, let counsel. me ask you this, counsel. It, it, I'm on the screen. Hello. Hi. So uh, beyond the, yes, good afternoon. Beyond the, the inference that they must have known, which is act, right, an inference of actual knowledge, I want to stick with this question about the constructive knowledge. They should have known. I know your adversary argues that that's not the standard, but, but let's just stay with it. Because it struck me that your pleading was suggesting not only constructive notice, but also that there was um, inquiry notice, right? That, that they were on notice at a minimum that they should have now inquired, which is I think what you were somewhat referring to. So I just want to clarify if that is your argumentation regarding how we should interpret this pleading, the, the fair and reasonable inferences to be drawn from the pleading. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I believe we are, we should be able to get all three inferences. We should be able to get the inferences that they knew about the drinking, the trading, and that they were lied to about a missing $8 million in a very bald-faced mm -hmm. way. We should be able to get the inferences that so if somehow they didn't know they were being lied to, they should have known they were being lied to, constructive notice. And we should get the inference at the pleading stage that they were at the very least under a duty to further inquire, given his coming to work drunk, drunk uh, you know, visibly drunk, given, and given the fact that he lied to them about the... Uh, about and now, the so on that third one, this is uh, uh, following up somewhat on, on uh, Judge Conantaro's point, it, does that inquiry what you're calling that duty extend to trying to identify whether or not, look, this guy's just negligent, he's going to do a bad job, or this person is actually going to go out and commit fraud and steal from clients, potential clients from us. So what, what is the, the, the scope of that? Where does the inquiry sort of end? So at the very least, for the lie that he told about the missing $8 million, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That inquiry leads to the idea we have a very dishonest person here who's lying to us about large sums of money. And that puts them on inquiry that they should have looked into what actually happened with the money. And the facts are, if they look into what happened to the money, my client would have never been defrauded. That happened in September, they asked that question and got lied to. My client was defrauded in November. As for the other matters, the, uh, the, the drinking and the obsessive trading, again, if, if they had inquired into it, they were under a duty to inquire into it, into it at the very least. They would have discovered not just that he was acting negligently, but that he was doing things that were going to potentially harm their current or prospective clients. So, counsel, counsel, on that point, uh, and in your red light, Tom, but just the last question. Um, there's an alternate finding by the appellate division uh, about the complaint failing to allege that this was a cost, you were a customer uh, of, of the defendants. My question isn't so much about the substance of that finding, but a procedural issue. So it, you could read the appellate division to be saying, although that argument was raised in a reply brief, I believe, and this, the trial court never got to it, but they were finding an exception. If we disagree with that, what happens? 
that there is no preservation exception that applies here, and we can't reach the issue, what happens? If you disagree with them having reached the issue? You're right. We well, disagree that this is, there's an exception to preservation that would allow us to reach the issue. I think in that case, Your Honor, you would have to vacate that decision by the appellate division as to having they improperly reached the issue. But how do you square Hecker with that, where we found that they have interest of justice power we don't have, so they're not constrained by the same preservation rules? Well, I think, Your Honor, given that they reached that issue and we appealed it, I mean, it, it would be a, a bizarre circumstance where the dagger through our heart was something that they should not have reached and they reached it and we properly preserved it for this and court. And that was Judge Smith's argument in concurring in Hecker. <laughs> but it seems a difficult one. I mean, assuming, just for the sake of this argument, that we disagree on preservation exception, it seems to me that would be a Hecker problem for you. Well, Your Honor, we, to be honest, we didn't brief this. It wasn't raised, and I'd ask for the chance to brief it if this is something the court is considering working on. It was not something raised by our adversary. Thank you. Counsel. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, this court has never endorsed a duty to uh, investigate employees who are dealing with strangers. Well, That's counsel, what can, can we pick up on, on the last point that Judge Garcia made? Should we even be reviewing that issue, considering that the Supreme Court declined to, to entertain it, and the appellate division, you know, they don't give us a lot to go on, but they seem to have, have thought that some exception applied, but we are free to disagree with that. What happens if we disagree with it? If you disagree with that, I think you still affirm because of what happened here. Um, the appellate division found that Mr. Casperson was not acting within his actual uh, or apparent authority here. Uh, the appellate division found that he wasn't acting in the course of his employment. What, what the plaintiffs here are asking you to do is to impose a duty on anybody who gives an employee a phone or email access to fully investigate them. Or but I think what Judge Canatero is asking you is can we reach the issue at all? Absolutely, Your Honor. The appellate division legitimately reached the issue. Uh, that issue was actually, whether they could reach it was actually briefed in the court below. Uh, and there are cases that make clear that, that the court has the jurisdiction to do it where it's a pure question of law. But as Judge Garcia pointed out to you, I'm sorry to go back and forth like that, but as Judge Garcia pointed out, the appellate division has powers, has jurisdictional powers that we don't. Specifically, they could have reached that in issue in the interest of justice, which we don't have the power to review. So. If you I'm, don't I'm just questioning your absolute statement. Well, if you don't have the power to review it, then the decision of the appellate division should stand where it does have the power to reach that decision, right? Um, and uh, further, just as a matter of interest, that issue was raised not really in our reply brief in the court below, but in the opinion from Judge Ramos in the Heffernan case that the plaintiffs chose to submit with their brief which squarely addressed that issue and squarely found no duty where the, uh, the plaintiff was not an actual customer. So could I ask you then, sorry, over here, could I, could I ask you to address the substance of that issue, the customer issue? Absolutely. Uh, this court has always been reluctant to impose, duty, to impose a duty to protect against economic harm. The key case on point is the Madison case, the Finlandia case, where the court found that in the absence of injury to person or property, there was no duty to protect others against pure economic harm in the absence of a contractual relationship. And the court in that case examined all of the cases on this point from the Court of Appeals and found that in every other case, there was a contractual relationship between the parties. That view is consistent with the restatement of torts on economic liability and the concerns expressed by the court in Madison are also consistent with that opinion. Those concerns are that if you impose economic injury liability in the absence of a special relationship or personal injury or property damage, you are vastly expanding the liability of all parties to an insurer-like liability for anybody who does business with them. And the court refused to do that in the Madison Avenue case. Now, in that, that issue is barely touched on by Moore here. They only talk about it in their reply brief, and they say, don't worry. Customers of Park Hill and PJT are very sophisticated. They won't cause great liability, but there's a problem with that argument. First, well, counsel, not before you get to that, I'm sorry, before you get to that other argument, the plaintiffs in Finlandia were not, you know, and I, and I think at some point 
you maybe should talk about the nature of the relationship that's being, at least being alleged or that existed. But the plaintiffs in Finlandia were people in the neighborhood, in the area, who were affected by the, the wall collapsing or whatever it was. Um, these people allege that, at least from their perspective, that they were entering into a direct relationship with PJT, or were well, ab about to. And I, I wonder, and I, I hear you say, you know, and I acknowledge that you say that we've never really recognized that duty before, but it is a different kind of duty than the one that was analyzed in Finland. Absolutely. It's in fact to impose a greater duty because here the plaintiffs voluntarily decided to do business with Kasperson, whereas in the Finlandia case, the, the plaintiffs were affected by a falling crane. That was the issue in the case. Sorry about that. Which caused substantial <laughs> property and personal damage as well as financial harm to many. And the court found that there was no duty to protect those third parties against, um, against economic harm in the absence of property damage or personal injury. Here, Kasperson went to the plaintiffs with an offer that stinks of fraud. I mean, it's in the record, it's at page 78. What Kasperson says to his- But counsel I'm, uh, counsel, I'm going to interrupt you, I'm on the screen. The only uh, way he could do that is because he was an employee and he had this other deal that he had uh, that he had uh, attempted to close on with the employ for his employer. So the only reason he is in this position to commit the fraud is because of this employer employee relationship. And isn't that what the plaintiffs are relying on? That this is an employee. Don't they see him as the employee coming to them? on behalf of the employer? What the plaintiffs, I think, are trying to say is even though, as the courts below found, he was not acting within the scope of his actual or apparent authority, he was not acting for the benefit of his employer, you should still hold the employer liable for anything he might do just because he has a phone or an email address. And in this case, what he did was he wrote to his friend, it was great to see you last weekend. I've structured a new investment uh, that may be of interest. I'm investing personally, and I thought this might be a good fit for more capital. But, but of course, but how else would he say that? Because that was his job for him to set up those deals and to look for other deals. I mean, they brought him in to develop this book of work, right? I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm finding it a little confusing. I get your point about acting outside of uh, whatever would be for the benefit of the employer, but still he is cloaked with the authority of the employer when he is doing this and it's pursuant to a deal that he actually did do for his employer for the benefit of his employer. Well, so you can't say it's wholly, wholly for his own benefit in, in the truest sense. Some of this work is built for the benefit of the employer. Yes, the fraud, of course, is not for the benefit of the employer, no doubt. But the, the appellate division has already decided that issue, and, and the plaintiffs have not appealed that decision. The appellate division actually did conclude that this was not within the scope of his actual or apparent authority. The appellate division said specifically his actual authority was to do something different. Further, the something different, the actual repurchase of the private equity interests in, in uh, Irving Place, had already been achieved and was publicly disclosed. What Kasperson did was go to his friend and offer a risk-free 15% loan. Now, plaintiffs quibble with my description of that as risk-free in their reply brief, but I didn't call it risk-free. They did. Paragraph 41 of their complaint says that what Kasperson did was offer an investment with a 15% risk-free return. That's not something that PJT does, and, and further, but, but again, that we're at the motion to dismiss stage and we have to draw all the reasonable inferences from the complaint, right? And you have to I, draw it's, 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 it's very hard to see how the complaint it doesn't get past the hump of simply stating that indeed he was doing this using the fact that he was employed by this particular employer to indeed pursue this kind of client base. I mean, he's hired to get all the connections he has to bring in more money and to close several deals. I mean, that, that, that's what he's hired to do. He's hired to do a specific kind of deal, which the appellate division has already determined this was not. And that issue is not on appeal. 
So I think this court is bound by the conclusion of the appellate division that this was not within his actual authority or his apparent authority. And as a matter of law, the well, court has be, to decide. That can't be a factual finding because this is on a motion to dismiss. So that would be a legal conclusion by the appellate division, which we would be free to review. But the, the, that, that issue is not an appeal. The, the appellate division determined that this was not within the scope of his authority. They don't argue otherwise. What they say is in addition to an actual authority or apparent authority or vicarious liability theory, you should impose a duty on any employer that gives an employee a phone or an email address, even though they are enticing people to enter into deals that are risk-free at 15%, that are not within the scope of their authority. That's Counsel, the duty they the, ask you to impose. It's, it's conceded that there's, I think it's conceded that there's no respondeat superior liability here. But a tort has been recognized in New York for negligent supervision, direct negligence between your client and and the plaintiff. And my understanding of the way the, the duty arises in that tort is, and this goes to a question that uh, Judge Rivera asked you a moment ago, is that it either takes place on the premises of, of, the, of the defendant or that it involves the use of defendant's chattel. And I think that's what she means by apparent authority. He's sending out letters on company letterhead. He's sending emails through the company email and he's making it all look very legit and saying, uh, you know, do this amazing investment, as you, as you say, too good to be true, actually. But he's making it look very much like the business of, of your company. And the only question we have to decide here is, should you have known about that? Well, no, with respect, I think what you have to decide is whether there is a legal duty to the plaintiff in this situation. Fair enough. Foreseeability is not the basis for a duty in New York law based on the Finlandia case. So you have to decide whether to extend liability to third parties who do business with an employee who offers them something that's not within the scope of his authority. And I think and that, I think that pertains laws. to the nature of the relationship. So what is the nature of the relationship vis-a-vis either the plaintiff or the defendant. And there's no relationship between the plaintiff and the defendant here. This was somebody they had not done business with, who had no history with the company, who had no relationship with the company, who hadn't been involved in prior transactions, who was approached by his friend who happened to work there and offered a deal that doesn't look anything like what the company did. It was a loan at 15%. That's a deal that does not exist. Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal, counsel. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor. I just. As a factual matter, we certainly have alleged, I think it would be true, that if Mr. Casperson brought in more capital or the more foundation to participate in a deal, a legitimate deal, PJT would have been thrilled. They are in a, within a narrow class of private equity fund, more capital, who they reached out to originally, and people and institutions with enough money to buy a limited partnership interests or otherwise participate in these deals. We alleged it in our reply brief. We pointed the court to all the allegations. So this is not about... Well, counsel, just to clarify, I think this is also where you're going. I think your point is it, it can't be what they're saying because, of course, it, it, the, the, he couldn't have kept the money. I mean, there's just no way that he could have kept the money if it was a lawful deal, right? That's, isn't that your point? So it does fall within what they anticipated he would be doing. Not right. the fraud, but the reaching out to potential clients. Right. They're reaching out to potential clients. That part of it is a legitimate part of his deal. And these are potential clients, potential LPs and potential private equity but funds. But, Counselor, wasn't it just his friend that he was reaching out to? How can you say emphatically that it was a potential client and that he wouldn't have kept the money himself to pay off whatever debts he had? How are we so certain of that? It, it is possible that the friendship, uh, they, the, the, the defendants allege that the friendship played a role. But they do say specifically in one of their footnotes in their opposition brief that the friendship is actually irrelevant to the legal issues before the court. Counsel, can I just ask, why isn't this Heffernan? Um, why, why isn't this Heffernan? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a Ponzi scheme, just, just like there was in Heffernan. The person is going out asking people for money from his, from his company chair. And, and with respect to the direct negligence claim, the first department said there as well, there was no duty. Well, at least in that case, to distinguish it, those plaintiffs were specifically told, I'm getting you on a deal you have no right to do. They were effectively told by the wrongdoer, you can't be a client for this kind of deal, but I'm going to get you in the back door for it. So that's one factual distinction. But, Your Honor, honestly, 
if isn't they were. That, that's a lot like the here's this deal. It's it's so amazing. You're never going to believe it. But I'm offering it to no, you. No, but our client thought they were putting aside that I think in this day and age people can understand occasionally private equity firms get get in on too good to be true are very very favorable deals in the hopes of of churning up future business from them, which is exactly what this looked like. In the email, he says. I can talk to you about why this deal is structured as it is for relationship reasons. So that's a factual issue, Your Honor, that I think we can at least get to a jury, if not summary judgment, we can see what they were saying internally. On, if, if I, I know the red light is on. The only other thing I wanted to tell the court is there are a number of cases about this nexus and how it's a factual issue between the types of behavior and propensity. In cases like Chenango and Chichester and TW, you know, Chenango, it was that the person had exposed his adult diaper and they found that was sufficient uh, to, to have seen a propensity for sexual assault. So it's, it doesn't have to be the exact same kind of prior misconduct. We would put on expert evidence about the, the, the pr propensity of people who get very drunk and, and trade and lose a lot of money to commit frauds or other thefts. Um, thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Counsel.